My name is Monk Rowe for the Phillies Jazz Archive, and I'm very pleased. At 10 a.m. in the morning, not a jazz musician's time usually, but to have Charles Tolliver as a guest today. Thank you for joining me. You're welcome. Before I started uh, recording, you, you said you had a lot of tasks, but they were all in music. So I'm, I'm curious what projects you're able to pursue during this uh, basic time of most things being shut down. Well, uh, it's been a challenge, uh, as uh, you can imagine. Um, basically, for the last uh, year and five months, all of us have been experiencing this. Um, it's been um, going out every few days to get provisions. <laughs> yes. And, uh, coming back in the house and um, dealing with as much music um, as one can to you know, stay uh, sane, I guess. Mm hmm. Am I correct that uh, your grandmother, we can thank your grandmother for handing you a, a cornet? Yes. Grandmama Leela. Can I ask you why you wanted it? What was it that might have been going on in your household or in your neighborhood or on the radio, perhaps, that made you want to get your hands on that cornet? Well, by the time I was five years old, my mom's uh, had a uh, genuine Victrola, <laughs> you know, just like the ones that are in the museum. And um, she had um, the jazz at the Philharmonic recordings by Norman Grants, you know, pretty hip for that time, uh, and uh, I'd sit myself down and put that big arm on those thick 78s and, and listening to all of that is what got me to where I am today, and I believe it was probably Little Jazz, Roy Eldridge and uh, Charlie Shavers. <clears throat> uh, you know, just the sound of the trumpet, you know. And of course, Dizzy Gillespie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I was about six or seven or so, uh, you know, just walking. Uh, through the sandy streets of Jacksonville. You know, at that time, there were no pavement. Oh. There was no asphalt. Even for a, a metropolis town like uh, Jacksonville, uh, certain areas, it was just sand, you know? And um, there was this little pawn shop that I would pass every day going from kindergarten back home. And, uh, I saw this cornet hanging in the window, you know, enticing someone to <laughs> come in and uh, get it. And above it was some sheet music of Dizzy Gillespie. You know what I'm saying? Oh boy, this is right up my alley. <laughs> That's like a message from somewhere. Yeah, so I, I, I said to Grandmama, you know, I, I sure would like to have that coin and, and, you know, God bless her, you can imagine, you know, we're talking 1947, 48. Um, I don't know how she saved the pennies, but she went and got that thing for me. And um, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. And I, you must have seen some pictures to connect what you were hearing on the 78s to 
what the instrument was, or or maybe you asked around, like, wh what is that sound? Well, I was already in the drum and bugle corps at my okay. grade school. Switching be from the bugle to the uh, to the drums, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, music was always there in one form or another all the time. So, I mean, I knew, <clears throat> of course, uh, what the instrument looked like and sounded like, of course. Okay. And, uh, it was a matter of my getting my hands on one that I could have 24 seven, you know? Yes. Um, it looks like from what I've read, you took a, a, a bit of a detour when it came time for uh, college that you were pursuing a career in pharmacy? Yeah, well, this is, um, this is a Hollywood story, you know. <laughs> so, you know, in my um, uh, last couple of years of uh, high school, of course, I was in the swing band and the marching band and the concert band at high school so um i'm with that trumpet all the time and um so i you know wanted to earn a little money and uh, i asked the neighborhood pharmacist which i believe probably was the only uh, black owned um, apothecary because that's what it that's what it was it was you know it wasn't they didn't have the words pharmacy on their window <clears throat> it was an apothecary mm -hmm. which is really i mean the you, you go into the weeds of uh, pharmacology it's about you know the apothecary and uh, <laughs> and so i'm sitting waiting you know I, my job was to deliver uh, the medicine to the neighborhood folks and i'm sitting watching them uh, the two doctors, because they weren't called pharmacists, they were doctors, hmm. you know, the title pharmacist was, uh, you know, there, but, you know, they were considered pharmacists, you know, I mean, uh, apothecarians. So anyway, I'm sitting watching them and um, they are using this uh, mortar and pestle, you know, and uh, mixing this medicine and I'm saying to myself as I was to surmise you know a little bit later that if they didn't mix it right the patient just might die I mean today uh, you know in the modern world uh, although uh, folks are trained you know in pharmacology and they know what the meds are that you know go into it <clears throat> but basically when a prescription comes in they just press a, a carous wheel and the <laughs> yeah and there it is there it is the bottle is there in that time uh the pharmacist he had to mix most of the medicine and uh this just intrigued the hell out of me you know <laughs> And uh, I said, I want to do that. And uh, it was, it didn't dawn on me that I, uh, it would be any separation from dealing with that and music. So, I mean, I was accepted at um, the famous uh, Howard University College of Pharmacy. Uh, and um, off I went. And um, in my third year, most of my time was there, although I was in my pharma, pharmacy studies and uh, pharmaceuticals and everything. But a lot of my time was spent in the fine arts building, <laughs> you know, in the music, uh, down in the dungeons of one of those uh, mm -hmm. practice rooms, you know. And um, in my third year, I just, you know, after working really hard on that trumpet i um i made a calculated decision that yes i could go on and finish but if i didn't get this now 
you know, what I was um, planning to do on the trumpet, you know. So off I went, went back home, and uh, the rest is history, you know. Did your, did your um, family members or your friends question that decision? And, and in your head, did you consider that making a mu making a career as a musician was going to be challenging and probably a, a less of an income than being a pharmacist. Uh, not for a nanosecond, because um, you know the music was in my head since I was five years old, and um, once I realized that you know I could actually produce that on the trumpet too. Uh, all I wanted to do was belong, nothing more, nothing less. And uh, uh, I didn't think about the fact that uh, it was very chancy, you know, to leave my mm. studies, you know, in college and um, go on this, you know, glorious venture you know and um i did get lucky though and it takes luck uh, a bit of luck in this um to meet the right people or be in the right place at the right time and that sort of really helped to kick start me you know just going full steam ahead you know mm -hmm. this as my uh, my life's life's work you know did your composing um develop as your trumpet playing developed what let me rephrase um do you remember the first time the first period that you felt i can compose also i can offer something that could be a tune uh, yes, um, you know, um, all of our original greats who created this, um, the realization is, is that, uh, they are actually composing as they are soloing mm -hmm. and it's inextricably tied together, you know, soloing and composing. So, um, you know. By example, you know, Charlie Parker, all of his compositions are solos, set down, scripted, you know, later that become, that became, you know, part of the underpinnings uh, compositionally, you know, of this art form, uh, Thelonious Monk, etc. I mean, Duke Ellington, you know, and you name it. And uh, I, I think somewhere After I came back home from college, I actually had started to write uh, before I left college. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, you know, my first songs, I, you know, I started to script them down. And there was a gentleman who's actually still alive. <clears throat> wonderful musician that in my high school years, he taught me how to uh, set down things on manuscript. And from there, my first couple of uh, songs that came into my head, I, I did that. And while at Howard uh, University, uh, one day I was in the fine arts building, of course, uh, in one of the practice rooms, and I happened to pass by a room in which I was hearing uh, these uh, chords being played by uh, a young lady, and I knocked on the door and asked if I could come in, and, and um, I said, what is that you're playing? And she said, oh, those are called minor ninths 
And I said, oh, really, can you show me that? And to this day, that's what I work off of. And uh, she said to me, oh, yes, um, uh, my husband is John Hicks. So they were teenagers. I would imagine they had to have been, you know, uh, when they got married. And um, she went on to get her degree there at Howard. And, of course, I was to meet uh, John uh, shortly thereafter in New York and of course uh, the rest is history with that one with his with us you know as well uh, and it was those uh, chords which you know open up uh, uh, compositional vistas for me and uh, arranging and orchestration and so yeah. on that's a um, a long process, and I think nowadays of we write many of us on finale and those those programs where you can sort of hear the music as you write it, and I contrast that with years ago when we would write like a big band chart. And that moment when it finally gets played and you hear it and hopefully <laughs> you hear it in all its glory. But I'm, in some cases you're going, oh, I didn't know it was going to sound like that. Yes, I mean, you know, as you gain more knowledge of, uh, you know, arranging orchestration, you know, compositions, uh one comes to realize that uh, one of the most important things is the weight of the instrument against another instrument. And if you, you know, after trial and error, um, you should be able to realize that, you know, if you give too much weight on a section, it's, um, it's going to come out sounding not like what you thought you heard, you know. Yes. And, you know, see, the, the, the classical uh, musicians from the 1500s on, including Beethoven, all of, the, all of the greats, Mozart, Haydn, they were lucky because all of the musicians were all, all housed in a barracks, <laughs> you know, at their command every day. So when they, they, they scripted out something, they brought it over to the barracks, <laughs> the, you know, music uh, area, and those guys, you know, played it, and they could hear it instantaneously, whether it was right or wrong or not, you know? Think about it. You know. I do. I think that's why Ellington kept this band together for so long, right? <laughs> that is a, a, a interesting observation. I had a quote here um, about both your composing and your playing. It it comes from one of those um, jazz on on CD books, and this particular reviewer made the observation that most of your compositions. Uh, instead of complex chords, I think he's referring to like bebop, um, he, Charles favors basic motifs, four or five notes in ostinato, and then he continued, it's very much harder to play inventively over such a background where the chords, other chords offered endless, endless permutations of changes, but Tolliver develops solo material apparently without limit in a highly lyrical mainstream style that recalls Clifford Brown. So I think the gist of that is he's pointing out that harmonically your music um, was simplified from some of those complex fast changes in the bebop world 
but you still manage to um, find ways to solo over that. Well, you know, um, I wouldn't be where I am today, uh, you know, in this art form, had it not been for Jackie McLean. I mean, you know, that's what I'm talking about, you know, that lucky break, you know. And um, my first, uh, my debut recording with him, as you know, uh, Jackie was a die in the wool, you know, bebopper. But that was, you know, I came in, in the, during that generational shift just as, uh, you know, the freer forms were being used, you know. I mean, he was already, he had already done uh, Destination Out and a couple of other things, <clears throat> which uh, portend that, uh, you know, he, you know, he wasn't just sitting, you know, doing bebop endlessly. And um, my my debut recording with him, I mean, you know, us kids at the time, we ate and slept Jackie McLean and all those guys. So we had it down, the bebop thing, and um, he, he wanted something a little bit different. And so, you know, like half of that recording is, is bebop and half of it is what you're talking about mm -hmm. and and from that experience i think is where you know i started to um you know do those sorts of things that uh, you know this uh, person uh, observed you know in my in my work but i think andrew hill is the one who really once I started playing with Andrew and recording with him, you know, that sort of thing really uh, became also a part of my uh, delivery mm -hmm. process. It just occurred to me that um, 1964 is a significant year for you. It was also the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. And if you extrapolate on that, was the situation um, socially and politically at that time, do you feel it affected the change in jazz that you're describing? Well, I think that... Um the development of, uh, you know, the jazz art form would have happened the way it did, even if the, uh, the social um, and political developments didn't happen around that same time. Uh, but of course, it uh, a lot of the artists, you know, they delved into that, you know, with the music, uh, you know, Charles Mangus and others, Max Roach, you know. Uh, but honestly, although I was paying closely attention to what was going on socially and politically, um, I didn't write or play my music with that in mind. Now, it might be hard for folks to believe that they didn't have that kind of a effect on me. But I sort of had blinders on, you know. Um, as I said, initially, I, you know, once I realized I could, you know, do something with this art form, I just wanted to belong. And in order for me to accomplish that, I put blinders on basically to everything else, <laughs> you know, uh, so. Is, is it safe to say you were uh, obsessed with it? I was totally obsessed with it till now, you know. <laughs> well, it makes me wonder. Um, I, I was sort of going to ask this question wherever our interview uh, wraps up, but I'll I'll try it now. Do Do you feel that you have sacrificed or given anything up um, for this music? Absolutely not. If I had it to do all over again, I'd do it exactly the same. Every bit of it, you know. 
I mean, we're blessed in a way, you know, us, uh, you know, artisans, you know, I mean, and it doesn't matter which idiom it is, you know, uh, jazz music, classical music, popular music, minimalist, <laughs> you know, um, you know, because Art Blakey's uh, well said um, parable uh, in that inimitable uh, voice of his, you know, when he would get off the drums and um, speak to the audience and said, you know, uh, we're here to wash away the dust of your everyday life. And uh, so I, I carry that in mind, you know, and so. When you recorded, performed and composed, did you have something in mind that you hoped your audience would glean f from your work? Yes, because as soloing and composition is inextricably tied to the musician, so is his communication to the audience. Without the audience, which is why this pandemic so much affected everything, uh, where you don't have a, a live audience to feed off of uh, you know, your offering. And uh, for me, um, it's like, um, you know, the heavyweight fight that's coming up where you're in the dressing room and you're getting taped up and uh, get ready, you know, to go out and give the best performance you can, the audience, you can feel when you hit the stage, uh, certainly if they know your work and they're there, and you can also feel and see those who are there to see what this is all about and if they like it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, just from that, it's just a glance, it's just a uh, you know, sort of finger in the wind uh, and off you go, you know, you know, with the music. And it's so vitally important, uh, the interaction, you know, with uh, the musicians on stage and the audience. Mm -hmm. If you felt that you weren't reaching the bulk of the audience, were there things that you worked on adjusting? No, because <laughs> I, I, my thing is to assemble the very best at this, at, you know, whatever the event is, the, uh, the venue, uh, musicians, uh, and this is from as a as a child and as a teenager watching because I got a chance to see just about everybody, you know, uh, just every just about everybody was still alive when I broke in, and uh, to the man, they never people there bands with anything less than just super musicians and um, so that stuck with me and so when I come on stage with a unit it's absolutely crack and so um, be between starting and ending you know that performance or that concert uh, I think the audience is, I haven't, I've never felt that um, they didn't get it or that they didn't um, appreciate what we offered. 
I mean, you, you know, you know, of course, there's a famous true historical story that um, when the Rites of Spring was performed in Paris, you know what happened. Yes. And it was a mistake by that audience, you know. But it didn't stop Stravinsky not one second. <laughs> and I mean, today it's just one of the greatest works of all time. It will yes, last yes. forever. And now when audiences go, they go there, you know, specifically to hear it and to enjoy it. Now that they realize, oh, you know, historically, you know, how important a work it is, you know, you know, <laughs> but with so, but, but with soloing uh, performances, you know, classical music is the, is the composer's performance. Uh, you know, the orchestra, if it's a well-trained orchestra, they can play a great work without the conductor. Absolutely. A great orchestra led by, you know, a, a, a great uh, a concert master, well rehearsed, they do not need the conductor. So, you know, uh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if you ever been, um, had ever attended a concert, some, let's say, uh, someone like Albert Eiler, who was on the, you know, the far end of where things could go and witnessed a reaction like the audience at the premiere of A Rite of Spring. Mm. Well, you know, those fellows, when, when they were creating, you know, that form, that free form thing, and I watched that because I broke in right at the same time. Uh, there wasn't an audience, really. There was like a few family and friends. And um, it, you know, the, the writers in the magazines gave it a, a big, big lift, you know. And uh, then people started to say, well, what, what is this all about? And started to come. And uh, there were two places on the Lower East Side where this was incubated and, and really got going. And one was called a speakeasy. Actually, that place is still there. Um, I mean, the location of it, mm -hmm. uh, where these guys would go. Uh, um, work on this and there was um, a place called Slugs uh, a little bit further east you know, on the lower east side of uh, Manhattan in what we call Alphabet City you know Avenue A, B, C and D mm -hmm. and um, there it started to really get legs you know in those places and um the rest is history with that too. I mean, um, for the beboppers, so-called you know straight-ahead guys, uh, you know some of it got in, incorporated into you know the mainstream of things. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, just like with classical music, you know things uh, got worked out. You know, mm -hmm. I mean. Uh, perfect example is, um, I mean, I guess my all-time favorite classical composer, musician, is Bartok. And the reason why is uh, not only is his works, you know, just out of this world great, but, you know, he said, you know, I'm really, I'm really a Bach guy, you know, but he took that and did like what happened in, with our 
art form with the guys that started there. You know, it got synthesized and uh, worked up into uh, the main body, uh, the quintessential body, uh, you know, of the art form. Uh, because, you know, Bartok's earlier work, you, you can hear that he loved Bach, you know. But then when you hear the, the string quartets, I mean, it's unsurpassed. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, then you hear, like, who you mentioned, Albert Eiler and Archie Shepp. I mean, Ar Archie Shepp is, is, is actually is not as far out as was Abel Al and some of the other guys because Archie can go I, either way, you know, as you know, and um, till today. Uh, and uh, all of the, you know, my generation that was coming up then, you know, uh, didn't matter what, what the instrument, uh, they all synthesized some of that and uh, made it even better what was being uh, attempted you know and so that's wondered, my take on uh, yeah you know. I've, I've wondered on occasion if the musicians like yourself and the the, the fellows you mentioned sat around and talked about how they were going to play was there discussions that said, like we might say, all right, we're gonna, we're not gonna play in this particular time signature. We're, we're just gonna see what happens. Or I, I guess what I'm trying to say was any of this music pre-planned before you got on the bandstand, or did it happen as it was being created? I would imagine some of it did happen as it was being created, that whoever was the band leader said, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, these couple of notes or whatever, maybe. Uh, let's just work off of uh, that and, uh, you know, see what we get. Um, you know, John Coltrane, I mean, we all got a chance to watch that develop, you know, from the from the beginning when he put that band, you know, the quartet together, finally, you know, who were going to be in it you know, for that run till his death. And um, they rehearsed, you know, and when it got to the point when he decided he wanted to go interstellar, I, I, I think he probably gave a couple of notes, you know, to work off of, you know, to McCoy and, uh, and um, off they went. I mean, in that case with you have a band where each instrumentalist in the band is creating uh, a, a a path that's going to be uh, hi historical, uh, then young players pick up on that. And if they want to do that, they probably say, uh, I want this to go something like on, on that record or on this record, you know? Mm -hmm. When I work with um, Andrew Hill, Andrew scripted out a lead sheet, but he never said, okay, you have to play it this way or that way. It was really just a, uh, a, a guidepost because he expected you to uh, take it and do how you wanted to do with it, you know. And what a for, what a musician for like me, that had. was that was a you know my experience with Andrew Hill was very important uh, in my career you know because of of how he handled what you're asking about. Mm -hmm. you know? Would a musician like 
Andrew um, or others who were, quote, sort of leading, would they ever fire a musician or would they just like sort of move on if they weren't happy with what was being offered? Well, of course, some musicians got verbally verbally fired, <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine. Uh, but generally, you just never got called again. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to do that? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> oh, what, what do you mean? Have I ever well, had I mean, to like... fire? Have I had to fire a musician? I've had to not use a musician mm -hmm. because um, I just felt that uh, they needed to do what they were doing somewhere else. You Good know? way to put it. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and these, you know, as I said, I don't, I don't people the band unless the musician is great on his instrument. So it had nothing to do with the fact that they weren't great on the instrument. It had to do with what they were doing with, with that group with that you know. I see. Yeah. let's talk about um, Strata East um, I'm going to read uh, another quote ab about the label uh, this was a description uh, Strata East operated on a minimal finance and maximal passion a pivotal platform for the independent jazz movement that emerged from the civil rights in the 1970s. And before that, there was they had mentioned um, Pharaoh Sanders as being on the label with, with one album, I guess. And they called him one of the leaders of the movement. So my question is, did you and Stanley Cowell feel that your label was part of some movement. Well, there are three things in that which which you just read, which need to be um, clarified. Let's put it that way. Um, the label that it was to become wasn't created because, again, of the political or social environment going on. So, you know, the, what you said about, can you read that again so I can? Yeah, I, I, he. Um, but just read what you what you read. Okay, operate on a minimal, minimal finances, maximal passion, a pivotal platform for the independent jazz movement that emerged from civil rights in the 1970s. Okay, okay. It didn't emerge from the civil rights movement because uh, my idea to, to do an independent uh, endeavor like this um, stemmed from let's say two events. First of all, when I was coming up uh, and you really got into this, you either, you know, got your own leader date at Blue Note or one of the other independents that was going on at the time. That didn't happen for me, nor did it happen for um, uh, Woody Shaw. Because both of us are coming up at the same time, it 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 should have, you know, because of who we recorded with, you know, on Blue Note. Uh, both of us recorded with Jack and Colleen and Horace Silver, and both worked in Horace Silver band, and Max Roach as well, but Alfred Lyon sold Blue Note Records in 1966, right? Or 65, I forget. And he didn't get around to giving us a record date. Things would be completely different 
in terms of uh, the historical, you know, uh, thing of, of, of my career, uh, had that happened. So by 1968, 69, I was already, I already had this, what was going to become, you know, Strata East Records. I was going to do it. It was just a matter of time. And, and because my dear Stanley Cowell and I were so close, you know, every day and, you know, working with Max Roach and watching what he did, uh, it was inevitable that, you know, at that particular time in 1970, uh, that we, we were going to go in the studio and make a recording, which would be, you know, the first record to launch the label. And it had nothing to do with anything else but us finally putting out a product under our own name and see where it goes, you know? In fact, I shopped it first to the independents, but it was a big van record, so they, uh, it, they weren't biting on it, and it, I didn't care because I was going to do it anyway. <laughs> you know, so so it had absolutely nothing to do with this, you know, you know, that first part of what you just read. And I appreciate that they could read into that that it did because it happened right then when, uh, when we were, the country was steaming, you know. And uh LBJ he as he was told by his his famous uh Senate colleague, you know, if you do this, you lose the South. And that's exactly what happened politically. But I wasn't, that didn't factor in, you know, or, you know, with the, you know, the, the unrest and, of course, the riots that happened, you know, with Martin Luther King's death and um, uh, everything. Uh, everything uh, was already incubated to, to do what we were going to do, you know, with Strata East uh, before any of that happened. Now, uh, I don't know if Farrell Saunders was a part of the uh, free jazz movement, but um, he was going to be who he became anyway. Uh, let's put it this way. And I think they will all, obviously they, they've they said this, and you know, with, without John Coltrane, that would not have happened. And so the reason why Farrell Saunders' recording landed with Strata East was because of the great Clifford Jordan. I mean, actually, the... When Clifford Jordan saw what we did with the first recording, he said to me, he said, you know, I already done that. And he had. He had already recorded Farrell Saunders and, and uh, four others, which he called the Dolphy series. And he said, hey, run, here you go, run with it. So Clifford Jordan was as important as anything that ever we came with. Uh, in strategies because it helped to further jumpstart this venture. And of course, Farrell Saunders' record was one of them. And so it became, you know, one of the signature uh, uh, issues, you know, of the label. But, um, and I'll just go on with this since we're on this strategies topic. Um, now, after about two years in, all the musicians start ears start to prop up, you know, as to what's going on with this strategy thing, you know. And um, you know, one day, you know, a guy walked into the office named Gil Scott Heron, and he said, "I want to do that too." He had, like everybody else, was required to already have done their product. We created the conduit by which it, it would get to the marketplace. And, and uh, of course, the rest is history with that one because it just so happened that he had one track on there that took off. Can I ask, can I pause for a moment there? Um, 
are you saying that the artists had their recordings already completed and they came to you f for whatever your label could offer? Exactly. And see, there was the misunderstanding, you know, it, the rest of the industry and other musicians and everything uh, during that time up until today for a lot of them because they never understood how it worked. And the reason why is because I, I wanted it that way. I wanted it to have the look of a regular record company. Yeah. And the assumption was that we were putting these artists under contract and, you know, issuing their product. I would never have had that kind of adventure. It was about the musician investing in himself oh. and becoming the major recipient of what came back. That's how it functioned. So when this fellow who wrote this thing, you know, on a minimal, minimal budget, <laughs> it was less than a minimal budget. I mean, if I think back, I don't know how. I was able to, you know, negotiate, you know, uh, the business, you know, in terms of having an office finally to do all of this. But I mean, you know, I was able to do that. I mean, I, you know, you know, if, if, if I was going to be a pharmacist, that meant that I was pretty good at chess. I was pretty good at chemistry and math. So, you know, you know, you don't have to only just be a musician. I think most musicians are pretty good at chess and those things, too. It just so happened that I could multitask at the drop of a hat. So, you know, that, that's, that's the way it went. So, yes, each musician, they would come and say, you know, wow, I'd like to do that. How you do that? I said, well, do you have a product already? Well, not yet. I say, go get one, go make one. Or if they came, if they already knew that that was the deal, they would come with it already. We listen to it. We say, okay, boom, you're in, go. You know. Did you ever um, have someone come in with their product and say, well, this has a potential? Did you get in a position where you started giving advice? Try again, and 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 make it more this or that. No. <laughs> so when they come, it, it was be, you know, wow, man. Okay, here's a young fellow. He wants to do this. I listened to it, and if it was decently recorded and they had and the package was nice. I might suggest to them, yeah, you might want to do, you know, this with the cover or something, you know. But all of them had already saw the covers of things that had already come out. So, you know, there wasn't an art department that created these things. They did. I see. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of it, you know. Um, and uh, so. The rest is history. And I mean, it, it, you know, at one point, I think we had about 65 all told. And the deal was that if you're unsatisfied, you know, with the result, you know, you can take your product and start to do it yourself, you know, which, which did happen you know, with, 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 uh, with some of them. And that was fine. Um, the whole idea was that it would be influential to um, enough of musicians who were known and were working that, you know, the product would, would sell itself because they're, then, they're working and they can have it to sell you know, on their, on their venues or, or whatever, besides the mom and pop dis distribution system, you know, that um, we had set up, you know, during those years. And this all went uh, for about 10 years, you know. And, and around 1980, I decided to slow things down because I just needed to take a break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had gone hard at that, at, you know, for 10 years. You know, the, the operation never ceased. It never stopped. I just went 
quiet with it, you know. And um, uh, in any way, you know, the um, uh, the digital age was coming, and um, I just, you know, during the eighties, I just concentrated solely, you know, on uh, writing music, taking bands, you know, wherever. And uh, around 89, with uh, the digital format now getting ready to really shoot out there, I retooled and uh, reissued uh, on CD just those um, LPs that I that I like that we still are, you know we're dealing with the LP um, uh, merchandising never stopped because the Japanese you know mm-hmm. they were gung ho on uh, this you know from jump and the Brits uh, you know and, and uh, so the you know overseas you know things still went on as usual. I just wasn't not going to be strapped down to, you know, going into an office situation. No. You know? Did you ever um, feel the need to take a break, not only from your label, but from actually performing and composing? Did the business of finding gigs, et cetera, I, I can see you're shaking your head, so that, yeah. No, that would have been impossible. Mm-hmm. Not only because of uh, how I am, but because I am my grandmother <laughs> and my mother. So uh, you finish what you start. You know that's, that's you know so it was that it was never that was not going to happen. So it was never a thought of um, doing that. It's always been you know. Full out, full stop, you know, and um, till now, you know. I think maybe that's what keeps me going, you know, is um, um, uh, I, I, I still, as I began, I just wanted to belong, you know. I just wanted to belong to uh, this great art form, and so I was given a chance to do that by Jackie McLean. And um, so, I wonder if if we return to that 1964 date with Jackie, if you can describe or or you have a specific memory of that first recording and being in the studio or wherever it was and thinking, I, I'm trying to phrase this. Did you have a feeling like, yeah, now I'm getting there. Now I'm jumping in. This is a significant <laughs> moment for me. Uh, I'll say this. At one point, my knees were shaking, you know. Um, You know, when I decided to to leave uh, Howard University, you know, with my pharmacy studies and and, 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 and grapple with this thing, uh, that was the moment where I said, I know I can do this. And so anything that came after that was like gravy for me because <laughs> I, you know, I knew I could play that trumpet now the way I, I was hearing it, you know. And so... Um, what, what, what stood out for me was that Jackie McLean, so I was sent uh, to Jackie McLean, who actually is the guy responsible for, you know, me being where I am, you know, in terms of being in this now. Uh, Jim Harrison, and he, God bless him, he's still alive. So he, he had a Jackie McLean fan club. And in 1963, when I came back home, I used going around and doing all the jam sessions, of course. And this famous place in Brooklyn called the Blue Clarinet, he was there uh, listening, you know, happened to be there that night. And, you know, I'm jamming on the bandstand with uh, some new uh, arrivals to New York nobody had heard of before either, 
you know, Jack DeJanette, all right? And uh, we are brand new to this stuff, at, you know, the scene. And um, so I come over to the bandstand and, and, and Jim Harrison says, okay, you know, by the way, you know, Jackie McLean is, uh, he, he might be looking for a trumpet player. And he sent me to Jackie. And uh, that's how I met Jackie. I told him that Jim Harrison sent me. And Jackie said, okay, you know, come see me uh, you know, uh, this time, you know, and uh, let's see what's going on, you know, see what's going on. So I went to Jackie's house and he says, I got these tunes. Let's go over them. Right? And, uh, he played, uh, right? and he says, do you have any tunes? I said, yes, I do. He says, let me hear them. Let me play them. He says, okay, I'm putting you on my next record date. Now, I've told that story many times, and every time people said, you got to be kidding. He hadn't heard you yet. I said, well, he was going on what Jim Harrison said to, you know, hey, man, you know, there's a new toy player in town, you know. Boom. And so, uh, and then to get on that, uh, you know, there was a place called Lynn Oliver's Studio. It was a famous place on 89th and Broadway where most rehearsals for things went down. And that's what Alfred Lyons used for rehearsing bands before taking them to Rudy Van Gelder's. And I arrived for the first day's rehearsal. I did not know who Jackie McLean was having on his record date. I just knew, <laughs> wow, I'm going to be on my first record date. And um, I get to the studio and Alfred and Frank Wolf is beloved partner is there. And uh, I look at the drums and there's Roy Haynes sitting on the drums. So, you know, I'm already, oh man. And then, you know, in walks Herbie Hancock, you know, on the piano. The only new person, new persons was me and Cecil McBee. That's his first time out. And uh, Alfred, starts his clock watch, his uh, stopwatch to go through the tunes and uh, there's this famous hotel it's still there the empire hotel was the meeting place that's where every one of those great recordings of blue note started the old checker cab would be waiting in front of the hotel with a box full of sandwiches and beer soda liquor we all pile in those checkered cabs and off the rudy van gelders across the george washington bridge we'd go and that first recording uh, i still think that's one of the best recordings uh, of jackie and all of us you know on there because it was as we started this conversation, uh, it was it was loose and free, but at the same time cohesive with the uh, modern bebop jazz element as well. And uh, the interplay between um, Roy Haynes and uh, Herbie Hancock is just absolutely miraculous. I mean, it's one of the greatest performances by those two together ever. And the only time they've ever been commercially recorded, uh, you know, for a label. So uh, that particular record, not only being my debut record, it's a, you know, it's a substantial uh, contribution. That's a terrific story. I'm going to... Um, make a proposal here we've we've been uh talking for an hour and i wonder if you would if i could engage you for a, a part two in the near future sure all right i would uh, because there's lots of things i haven't got to and some things i want to follow up i mean just like you just said alfred started the stopwatch well i want to know about that so <laughs> We'll return to some of those things and um, 
so I'll pause our recording and we'll we'll say goodbye for today and we'll meet down the road. Sounds good. <laughs>